Hi, my name's Samuel Finlay, and you're listening to the Aces Podcast. In this episode, I share a conversation with Aces Chief Investigator and Monash University's Professor Douglas McFarlane. We chat about his career and journey in science, getting to where he is today, his work and role within ACES, and much more. So let's get to our chat. So I'm chatting with Professor Douglas McFarlane on the podcast today, who's an ACES Chief Investigator and Professor at Monash University. Thanks for joining me, Doug. Oh, good morning, and uh, it's good to be here. How's life been for you with COVID? Have you had to adjust to the, the current uh, working conditions, working from home, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a, been a very unusual time, um, that's for sure, for everybody. Um, adjusting to doing everything on Zoom was possibly the, uh, the biggest sort of um, shock, so to speak. Um, but in the end, I mean, uh, I've been doing quite a lot of teaching via Zoom, and that's, not, uh, that's been, not been too bad at all. And I think there's a certain sort of um, personal link to the students that's emerged from that uh, in an uh, almost unexpected way. Um, we had we were able to get um, a skeleton crew of of people um, of ACES people uh, into our labs during the the, the worst part of the lockdown um, because one part of our um, uh, electrocatalysis work um, has distinct applications in generating um, bleach like. Um, disinfectant solutions um, and at one stage in the early stages of the whole COVID thing it looked like we were going to be in dire straits uh, running out nationally of um, hand sanitizers right. and and larger quantities of sanitizers that you see in other parts of the world than you know spraying down streets and stalls and, and so on um, so that's effectively bleach um, in most cases and that is something that you can make directly by electrolysis of salty water and um, and that's of course is exactly the kind of research area that some of our crew are in so we we uh, working with a local company here in Melbourne we uh, called um, e-water systems we we put our time and effort into just trying to um, uh, get some detail around exactly how that could be um, implemented as a as a disinfectant medium and now you're an aces chief investigator and you're head of the energy program within aces so for those people who don't know what does the those roles exactly involve so so the the center the aces center is made up of um uh, a, a number of themes so these are these are research area themes um most in most cases if not all cases they cut across the individual universities that are partnered here so so those themes are multi multi group efforts so to speak um, <clears throat> within which there are quite a few um, investigators as in senior people academics and students and young researchers um, so one of those is the energy theme and uh, so I'm the the leader of that and that's um, principally goes on at Monash, Deakin and, and Wollongong um, with, with supporting, supporting uh, activities in, in the other nodes. Um, so so that's, it's, it's that coordination job that I, that I am responsible for. And then within, within those teams, uh, as I said, we've got uh, chief investigators who are the academics um, leading up individual research activities you, and your research activity usually involves a, a student or two uh, and, and a, a postdoc working on a particular thing and uh, as I was saying before one of those research themes um, is uh, electrolysis of water our, for many many years and, and still is um, our goal is hydrogen and what goes on on the other side of the on, on the other electrode of the cell which is usually oxygen in in pure water um, producing oxygen um, isn't normally so much of an interest to us as long as it is efficient um, this this um, saltwater electrolysis process produces chlorine on that on that electrode so you can very easily then make a, a bleach solution from that so that's why it was very easy for us to turn our our attention to to that um, that particular need at that time yeah, so we'll go um, into your current work in a little more detail in a moment, but I wanted to go back to your, I guess, career and its beginning. So why, why science? Um, <clears throat> I come from a, a very long line of, 
of um, um, engineers and physicists in, uh, you know, in my Scottish ancestry, so to speak. So Scotland has got, you know, a, an ancient history of being very much um, into engineering and, and, and the like. Um, so I kind of part of that, but certainly my own McFarland family, there's lots of physicists and engineers all there. And um, so, so my father was a civil engineer. Um, my uncle's an electrical engineer. Uh, so there was a fair bit of technical stuff that I was surrounded by as a kid, and I enjoyed it, of course. And, you know, pulling things apart. You know, and pull it. I think I pulled it, an old TV set apart, sort of when I was seven or eight. Um, much to the family's disgust. My father was always impressed that I could pull things apart, but he wasn't so impressed by my abilities or lack of to put things back together again. Um, <laughs> Because for me, it was, it was more, it was the um, curiosity of, as to how things worked that was driving me, you see. Um, so this is where I was a little bit more of a scientist than I was an engineer. You know, that, was, that was showing through at that point. I, didn't, I wasn't interested in putting it back together, but I did want to understand how it worked. Um, so, um, and then uh, some, some, somewhere around about eight or nine years old, uh, I was given for Christmas by my family a, um, a chemistry set. Back in those, those those days in the last century, a chemistry set like that was a serious bit of kit. There was some really good stuff, <laughs> <laughs> stuff that you would never be allowed to play with at home today. Um, and, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed this, and that started for me a lifelong interest in chemistry. Um, but this was to the disgust of my, um, the rest of my, my extended <laughs> family, who thought that chemistry was kind of a bit of a softy science. Um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, so they were quite disappointed but it didn't go into some form of engineering. <laughs> so where in Scotland is you and your family from originally? So, so my, my sort of ancestral family, both sides, mum and dad are all from Glasgow, but I was actually born um, like, uh, like Gordon Wallace, our director. I was, like, I was born in Belfast um, yeah. because my father, my father had moved there as a young engineer to Belfast, um, he was a civil engineer, water engineering, and had, was responsible in those sort of, this was the 1960s, laying out um, a very large part of Belfast's current day, um, uh, you know, fresh water supply. Well, so how about your undergraduate degree? So where did you first uh, study? All right, so so what happened um, then between between you know uh, Belfast days and uh, an undergrad was that my family uh, immigrated to New Zealand, so quite a long way around the world, um, oh. and uh, so I did my high schooling, my teenage years in New Zealand, and then uh, undergraduate was at Victoria University in, in uh, Wellington. Um, and all my uh, all my sort of close family is, is still in in Wellington. Um, so undergraduate was was there, and, and as I, I got to the end of honours, and, and in fact during that time, um, I uh, started um, started going out with my 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 wife, who's we're still married all, after all these years, um, uh, and she's an arts person, and she was doing all oh, history and various other anthropology, and very interestingly sort of very different to science, and and having gone. As you as you can, you can when you're an undergr undergraduate, having gone and sat through some of her her lectures with her, just out of interest. As, uh, whereas first year chemistry, frankly, was a little bit repetitive and uh, not very <laughs> interesting com compared to high school, where I had um, you know some really in, um, enthralling teachers in high school. So um, I developed then an interest in um, in doing some art subjects as well. And and by the end of undergraduate, by the end of honours year, I had managed to take out a, an arts degree in, in history and education as well, um, which uh, among other things, uh, I always felt I learned to write in, in my arts degree in, in a way that most science students never get trained to do, um, which has stood, stood me in good stead for the rest of my career. I'm sure. And then did you stay on at that same university to do your master's? Um, no. Um, so at the end of honours, which was a pretty uh, intense year um, at, at Vic, um, I was working with, with a group of people who had quite strong connections um, uh, of academics, who struck quite strong connections with a, a fellow called Austin Angel, who's a, an Australian um, who had um, settled for most of his academic career in, in the States, working at Purdue University. And uh, so he, there was quite strong connections with Austin, uh, still uh, with the Vic people. And um, 
and they all said to me, uh, Vic, they said, look, um, you know, the opportunities here in New Zealand in the 1980s aren't so great. So uh, we, we so go, go north, young man, basically, was the, <laughs> was the instruction or the advice. And kind of basically set me up with, um, with a connection to Austin, who quickly kind of took me on board, gave me a scholarship, and, uh, and off we went. I was married at this point by this time, and uh, off we went to West Lafayette, called Purdue University, and, and became uh, um, boilermakers of what they call people from Purdue, um, which is where we did our PhD. So did you always want to do a PhD when you were doing your undergraduate degree, or was it was one of those things where it just eventuated? Yeah, no, I, I think um, I think even as I went into undergraduate, I and and got to know because they were certainly a very friendly bunch at uh, in the chemistry group, very, very, very close community of chemists at uh, at Vic, um, and still are, um, but certainly certainly were in those days, and so I, I think I, I formulated that that um, ambition quite early in my undergraduate years, and I'd been somewhat surrounded um, in this extended family I was talking about by quite a few academics, mostly physicists um, in Scotland and in, in America. So I knew a little bit about the academic life, so to speak. It wasn't a mystery to me at all. And, um, and so I, it, it became an ambition quite early in, uh, in, in those times. So what did you actually do for your PhD? What was your project? Um, yeah, it was an interesting project that is basically became the foundation of of most of what I've done for the rest of my academic career, which is often the way, of course, but, <laughs> but not not in a straight line way, not at all a straight line way. Austin was was interested in uh, he's always been interested in um, molten salts and uh, and uh, the physical chemistry of of uh, solutions, um, not necessarily aqueous solutions, but including water based solutions, um, but in particular the the, the phenomenon of, of crystallization of, of the solvent, in some cases water or, or, or the salt, from those mixtures. So my, my, my project was very much focused on, um, on uh, the crystallization of, of ice out of various quite strongly salty or, or concentrated solutions of things in water, which was, it, it started off being um, focused on the on the physical chemistry phenomenology, shall we say? If you right, so this wasn't something that had huge applications, and this included as a function of pressure, and you know, that is not not doesn't immediately sort of think. Well, when when do you you know sort of come across that phenomenon in in real life, other than maybe in glaciers? Um, so, but but it was to understand the physical chemistry of this, you see. Um, but in, along the way, um, we after we published a paper or two. Um, uh, a fellow by the name of, of Dr. Greg Fahey from the Red Cross in uh, laboratories in Washington, D.C., got in touch and said, what you guys is absolutely what we want to know more about in, in our field of cryobiology. And I had to go away and look up what cryobiology was. Um, <laughs> and uh, it turned out that um, in, so this is the field of, of preservations of, of blood, of, of various tissues, skin, um, uh, cornea, all of these things that are, are, that are quite commonly um, transplanted today all had the preservation technology origins in this period in the 1980s. Um, a lot of it uh, came out of the, the, the Red Cross labs in, um, in Washington. The, the first um, blood preservation was, was, was proven there. Um, and what these guys were doing was uh, the, the problem with pre preserving any kind of tissue uh, at low temperatures, that's where the cryo bit comes in, is that the ice, sorry, the water freezes into ice. And if that's not done under stri strict control, the ice crystals just burst the cell membranes and, and the thing comes back dead. Um, the cells come back dead. So, so understanding how to control this and maybe even avoid it was, um, was an important ambition of this group, including even squeezing it under pressure to do it, which was quite actually sensible. Um, so the net result was that suddenly our work became quite prominent in this field and we, we started to do under their direction quite a lot of, of um, solutions that were, were of the sort that they were interested in, things like glycerol and um, dimethyl sulfoxide, common, common um, uh, aprotic um, uh, solvents, but mixed up with water, have a strong effect on the crystallization of ice. So, uh, so an early part of my career, leading out of, of PhD years, was um, was actually directed towards that cryobiology field, and gave me sort of quite an opportunity to become <coughs> quite um, prominent, shall we say, um, in a in a small field um, in, in an unexpected way. 
Right. So fast forwarding a little bit, how did the move to Australia and, and Monash come about? So, um, so we, at the end of PhD days, we decided that we didn't want to, when we very easily could have continued on um, to into an academic uh, post in the US, but uh, we, we kind of wanted to get back to family. Um, it, keeping in touch with family wasn't quite as easy then as it is today. So, um, so we, we looked for an opportunity back in, in uh, this part of the world. And uh, my old boss in uh, at Victoria in uh, Wellington um, said, look, I can arrange a university fellowship for you. And, and so quick as you like, um, we were back. Um, I was back as a postdoc um, in my old lab where I had done my undergraduate honors work. Um, so at that point, then we had to start looking around for a permanent uh, position, and um, there wasn't a lot going in New Zealand at that time. Um, whereas a, a position at Monash came up, and uh, I vividly re remember applying for this position, uh, <clears throat> um, which consisted of a handwritten um, sort of summary of my of my um, sort of background and and the papers that I published, which was not a large number, on what used to be called, um, for there'll be a, an older part of your audience that might know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and can, just, can just laugh, what used to be called an aerogram. It was how you sent an inexpensive um, letter by airmail, um, consisted of effectively about an A4 size piece of light blue paper, which folded up into thirds and became the envelope, if you like. Um, and so you wrote this out, folded it up, stuck it down and off it went. That was my application for the job. Oh, wow. um, when you think about the hundred page documents that people have to write for, for <laughs> a, an application these days, it's, and, um, and um, I think with, with strong support, obviously from Austin and, uh, and, and others back at Vic and John Tomlinson was the professor then at Vic. Um, I got the job at, um, Monash, and uh, we we arrived over here. I was in my late twenties at this point, and uh, um, at Melbourne, and uh, and off we went um, at, at Monash. I was one of the uh, the first people to be hired there, and only because because a, a, another sort of somewhat, uh, but not very much older person had died, probably because of their chemistry research. That's pretty awful. Um, um, I was one of the first people to be hired at, at Monash Chemistry for about 10 or 15 years. So the age gap between me and the next youngest people was quite, uh, quite substantial, quite a, quite a culture uh, difference. Wow. So what year was that that you arrived at Monash? Uh, that, was, that was late 1983. And you've been at Monash ever since? Yes. As I often say, um, tried to escape a few times, but never <laughs> successfully. <laughs> So um, I guess a little bit more on your current work uh, within the energy sort of area. Obviously, there's a lot of work on hydrogen and ammonia, and there's been a lot of publications and a lot of news that's come out about that. Could you just, I guess, give us a, an update on, on that area of work? So, um, so yeah, look, we got into to hydrogen and ammonia. Both of those came through our sort of more sort of longstanding uh, uh, research and, and uh, reputation in ionic liquids. Um, so liquid electrolytes, very salty, um, very conductive, very stable. So it's so good for all sorts of electrochemistry, which has been a bit of a platform for all sorts of stuff within ACES. So, so that, that, um, that technology, shall we say, or that chemistry has underpinned a lot of things. But it underpinned first the development of some new catalysts for water splitting for hydrogen studies. That was way back in the days when, um, um, when Leon Spitzio led that area within, within ACES. Um, so I had a joint student with him, Fengling Zhu, who, who uh, pioneered a number of, of interesting uh, catalysts that were made by electrodeposition in an ionic liquid. Um, so it was the medium for preparation, shall we say, at that stage. Uh, so, and that sort of progressively moved us into that field of, of understanding more and more about water electrolysis, shall we say. Very, very traditional field, um, but it's all about uh, catalysis if you're going to do it efficiently. And uh, through that, we, um, through some various um, interesting developments in the late sort of 2005 to 2010 period, we, we developed some interesting electrode structures that we termed breathable. In other words, the, the gases, hydrogen and oxygen, that are produced in this otherwise sort of simple two, leg, two electrodes dipping into a solution sort of cell, um, the two gases could, could escape uh, without ever forming bubbles out to the outside of, uh, of the, behind the electrode, so we say into a, into a gas 
plenum, um, and and off they went. And this this changed and made much more efficient both the design of the of the electrolyzer and also the electrochemistry of it. And um, so we we patented that, and that was a paper that was published in Science. Um, and then there was a patent came along, and uh, and then ultimately with with um, um, sort of parallel developments that was going that came were going on up at Wollongong with Gordon and Jerry uh, Swigers, um, we 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 formed jointly a, a spin-out company, Aquahydrix, um, which around about 2010 plus or minus, um, which of course has gone on now and is still is still um, uh, developing away, trying to get its uh, its technology sort of in the in the forefront of water electrolysis. And in the meantime, of course, hydrogen has become very much the the, the buzz of future energy storage and and fuel um, fuel matters. So that area of hydrogen uh, uh, production electrolysis cat catalysts, with a lot of emphasis, as more on the on the anode side, the oxygen producing electrodes, um, because that's where the inefficiency in the process actually lies. That's gone on in the, in the group. Um, um, now Sasha Simonov, one of the younger CIs, leads that area and, and has produced some very interesting work in recent times. Um, but then during the sort of the mid teens, as in around about 2015, um, I think it was, um, it was at one of the ACES meetings that um, that there was an interesting uh, character uh, talking about sort of the broad um, the, the the broad impact of of various uh, greenhouse gases and so on, and uh, who made the point that that fertilizer production was in a massive um, greenhouse polluting process in the world, and yet we need food, we need fertilizers to make food, and for fertilizers we need ammonia, and ammonia from the Haber Bosch process uses you know, um, coal or natural gas and produces a lot of CO2. So our food is mostly a fossil fuel product. It's an awful, it's an awful sort of situation to, to realize. So, um, so um, uh, that sort of prompted us to start to look at, at, at the whole ammonia process and the, the fact that actually the, the process of reducing nitrogen gas from the atmosphere around us to, to ammonia NH3 is really in an electrochemical cell is really very simple and and uh, in principle and um, and similar to our water electrolysis. So the whole setup and the idea is the same. The only thing that's different is the catalyst on the negative electrode that's producing the the reduced product. One one case is hydrogen. In the other case, you feed it nitrogen and you you get ammonia. So. So that, that led us on into our ammonia research. And again, the ionic liquid uh, advantage, shall we say, um, reappeared as an important possibility because ionic liquids have got some unique properties in this regard. And um, so during the, during the last um, four or five years then, um, as we've researched this um, further and further, the realization that ammonia um, is, is not only, uh, this is not just for fertilizers anymore, uh, it will be in the first place, but in the longer term, um, ammonia could be used as a hydrogen carrier. So in the whole hydrogen economy, the, one of the issues is how do you move it around? You know, Australia has absolutely enormous world relevant, world beating um, potential to, to produce renewables, uh, yeah. but how do we, how do we how do we ship them to Japan and Korea and China? Um, and the answer is, well, really, there's only for hydrogen. There's really one option, only one option. At least only one was one a couple of years ago. It's liquid hydrogen, and we are now shipping liquid hydrogen out of Australia to Japan. But it's not it's not a very good option in many respects. It's expensive uh, in all regards, and maybe not as safe as we would like to to have it. Um, but you can use that hydrogen in the Haber-Bosch process to make ammonia and then move ammonia in, to, in bulk carriers around the world. And that's, a, that's a, an everyday technology that happens um, uh, every day um, uh, for fertilizer production. So, so ammonia becomes the vector for the hydrogen energy is the, is the key sort of role of ammonia in that hydrogen economy picture. So that's as it was, maybe maybe even the beginning of last year. You know, that's how we all sort of saw ammonia fitting into this, and this was great. Um, and there was still a question of how do you make the ammonia best? And the electric, the ACES electrochemical method is still ultimately the the, the most efficient way of doing it. So our research is still relevant. But during during the last, literally in the last eighteen months, 
um, people ask me, you know, really, has this only been sort of understood in the last 18 months? And I've gone, yeah, surprisingly, yes. Yeah. That, that actually ammonia um, doesn't have to be turned back into hydrogen. Once you have ammonia, you can use it for a lot of things. And we recently published a, a roadmap paper in Joule, in the journal Joule, um, setting all this out um, so that ammonia can be used in almost every way that you use diesel or kerosene. So you can run trains and, uh, and, and heavy, heavy transport vehicles, buses, mining trucks on, on ammonia. The engine will run on ammonia. Generators, including small and, and uh, large scale power generators can run on ammonia. This is all known engineering. Um, the, one of the most astounding ones that, uh, that I've heard is you can actually fly a jet engine on ammonia. Wow. Ammonia, at, at, at high temperatures, ammonia burns like, 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 uh, like kerosene. Um, and it's a little safer than, in some respects than, than jet fuel because it's not nearly as flammable. It's a bit harder to get going, which is good because in a sense, that means it's slightly safer. Um, but one of the ones that's really kind of... Um, blown everybody away in the sense of the scale, um, but certainly galvanized everybody then that there, this really is important, um, is, is shipping. So the International Maritime Organization, which is a body that, that governs in a, in a sort of a strong legal way um, all the rules of shipping on international waters, has mandated that by 2050, um, all shipping um, mustn't produce more CO2 Sorry, it must be down to 50% of CO2 in, in today's terms. But the amount of shipping that will be going on in 2050 will make today's shipping or even half of it look like nothing. So, the, so basically what that means is that shipping by 2050 must be effectively fossil free, free, fossil right. fuel free. Um, how do you do that? And the answer is there's almost only one answer. It's ammonia. And therefore, um, there are now major shipping um, build, sh ship, uh, engine uh, builders and so on are all, all now designing ammonia, uh, marine diesels, um, and so on. And uh, the, 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 um, the demand, if you like, for ammonia is just, um, it's, it, it's just building every day. So, so ammonia suddenly is becoming a, a, a very, very big part of the, the future. So are you working with industry and collaborating to get this research to further end users? Uh, absolutely. So we've got quite strong contacts with, um, with, with companies like Woodside and Yarra, the, the big international fertilizer producer, and Siemens who are building these, uh, they're already in the business of building the electrolyzer um, equipment um, for hydrogen, but it's a very minor tweak to make it into an ammonia. Um, electrolyzer. So yes, we are, um, we're engaged with, with uh, a lot of these big companies um, uh, sort of scoping this out. Well, it all sounds very exciting. Now, um, I wanted to focus a little bit more on ACES and I wanted to ask how you found, because you've obviously been part of ACES as a chief investigator for some time, and I wanted to sort of ask how you found that experience and, and um, you know, as chief investigator within ACES. Well, look, ACES is, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's become quite a family, so to speak. Uh, I think there's, a, there's been a core group of us that have been, have been the, the architects and the leaders of it for, for, from the outset. Um, and um, uh, I mean, I vividly remember sitting with Gordon Wallace in, uh, in, in, in Boston Airport once coming back from some conference way back at the very beginning, scouting out for, for names. Um, to call the very first version of the centre. And wow. um, somehow or other, we didn't realise that the Australian Centre for Nano-Structured Electromaterials, um, it didn't quite dawn on us when we were sitting having that uh, discussion over a glass of beer in the, in the airport, um, <laughs> that, that ACNE isn't actually the best of names for a centre. <laughs> absolute shocker. It's um, not great. <laughs> that was a shocker. And, uh, but, but that was, that, that ACNE existed for the first <laughs> few years of our existence before we came up with, with, with ACES. Um, not that that was rocket science, but you know, there was a, back then there was a huge em emphasis on nano. And that's why the word nano had to appear somewhere. Um, but um, but yeah, so ACES has then become quite a, a community of, of, of like-minded, very collaborative individuals. And everybody who, who sort of visits or, or, or looks, on, looks into ACES, including our International Advisory Board, I think always comments on the, on the, the collaborative nature and the camaraderie and, the, and the, the, the general feeling that 
um, everybody enjoys working together and enjoys the, um, the, the, the community that nature is. And, and at a personal level, um, you know, when this started, um, started up, so to speak, um, was about the time approximately that I became head of school, uh, at Monash and, um, uh, head of school at Monash is, um, it's a, it's a, it's like running a small company. Well, not a very small company. I mean, there's 200 people come inside in the door every day and uh, not including the undergraduates, that's staff and PhD students. And, and the head of school's job is uh, pays for all of those people, organizes everything from the safety all the way down to the toilet paper. And, um, so it's quite a quite an onerous job, and I have often said that the only the only way that I manage to maintain my research um, productivity uh, and momentum um, through those four years that I was head of school um, was because of Aces. That the Aces had its own collaborative momentum that that kept um, that kept everything ticking over, um, even even though I was spending you know substantially you know sixty or seventy percent of my time doing completely different governance related things. Um, so that's the that's the nature of ACES. I think is is, is this big um, big sort of collaborative support um, uh, network, if you like, that that identifies good science and then is able to get on and, and do it. It's got the resources and the expertise to do it. And on a personal note, you've obviously had a very successful career so far. I'm I'm curious if you if there's one achievement that really stands out that you're most proud of. Um, one. Hmm. Um, I think or a couple yeah okay if we look historically back um, sort of over you know if you take sort of all the early days and recognizing that you know the magnitude of research we do today is quite a lot bigger than research we might have done 20 years ago but some of our really important ionic liquids discovery uh, discoveries were all in the late 90s um and and I think we're were and still are very much leading in the world um, uh, in that ionic liquids field. And some of the materials that are you know invented at Monash, so to speak, um, are, have now become completely completely standard in the field and are, are finding their way into batteries and, and so on. And um, yeah, so we're we're constantly part of that. You know, there are times when I can go to a conference and um, you know um, sit and listen to talks, and you know every every second talk will be working with or delving into an ionic liquid that was invented at Monash, so to speak. Um, a lot of people you know wouldn't even know that history if they if, if they are not they just buy it from the. So we have something of the order of thirty. Uh, last time I counted, something like thirty ionic liquid compounds that are sold by a number of of, um, of major suppliers. So most people don't realise that sort of you know, where, where these came from it doesn't doesn't matter. But it's just nice to see it been, them being used. So that would be one. And uh, and secondly, I think um, I think everything that we're doing at the moment with with, with ammonia, um, I think is is something that I'm very proud of. And um, you know we we haven't got it. We haven't actually solved the world's problems yet but but we've got the potential for something that we're doing at the moment in this area to become very significant in that global future sense um so even if we only make a small contribution to what is a is a massive worldwide effort i think that's that's something that i'll be i'll be I'll always be proud of so is there something maybe a morning routine or you know something that you do every day or morning that helps you approach uh the day ahead um Probably not very significantly so, um, <laughs> in the sense that in, in, in the morning, I probably like a lot of people, you know, as soon as, as soon as, as soon as my head's awake, so to speak, I, um, I get stuck into the emails um, to sort of tidy up all the things that are, are needing something set, you know, dealt with immediately. I try to, I, I've got to try to deal with the avalanche of, of stuff that comes past. I try to deal with as much as I can quickly, because um, then it's off my mind. Um, and, and then what's left are the things that need a, a, a longer or more, more sort of uh, involved response. So, so that's, as I said, that's probably not particularly significant. So I'm sure everybody does something like that. Um, but, but somewhere in the day, I do try to find some time to really delve into a bit of science that I want to delve into, shall we say, so that, um, uh, it sort of keeps the science part of your brain uh, or my brain, you know, ticking over if I genuinely let myself um, get into something. Um, this, this, this usually means that some student or postdoc um, finds me 
poking around in their data, digging out papers that they <laughs> hadn't found, digging out peripheral papers that maybe they should have found, you know, and generally irritating them. <laughs> but uh, and, but, they, but they, they get used to that as in the, the group will say, oh, Doug's, Doug's, on, Doug's on your project at the moment. Is he, and, oh, you know, it's still here. Um, but I think it, what I'm doing there is letting letting my myself sort of keep keep very active at the at the research level at the you know, deep research level, and um, and there's nothing pleases me more um, than if I have an opportunity to actually get into the lab and actually do something. I, I, I'm still very much a lab rat if I can get away with it. <laughs> so, what about life outside of research? What do you get up to in your spare time? Um, I'm a I'm a keen sailor. Um, so, uh, we would sail, um, uh, competitively once a week, usually if the, if the weather is clement, um, it's been, been dis- difficult this last <laughs> few months that, that was yeah, all banned. Um, and, um, so that's, uh, that's a significant activity. Love, I love sailing. Uh, my wife and I are very, very keen hikers. So we're always looking for the next opportunity to, to 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 hike somewhere um and, that, and both of those things require one to stay uh quite fit um in and so that so gym and other forms of exercise are, are an important everyday thing for me if you weren't doing research and what you currently do for a living today what do you think you would be doing obviously you mentioned you had an interest in arts and, and writing earlier but what, what do you think another career could have been for you if it weren't for science Look, I could easily easily have become an engineer. Um, that um, and there's all sorts of aspects of engineering and and construction that still fascinate me. I mean, maybe I should have said that we're also my wife and I are also keen keen renovators. There's um, um, you know lots of things that we love to do around the house, much to the amusement of our friends and neighbours. Um, and my <laughs> wife is, is is as keen on that as I am. So there. So this is not just a solitary activity, so to speak. We we egg each other on in a uh, <laughs> sometimes sometimes a foolish way <laughs> to do things that maybe we should have left to the experts. Um, but um, so so construction and and architectural um, aspects of construction always fascinate me. In other words, you know um, how is that built? Why does that stand up and not fall over? Um, things like that. Um, so I could easily have, Frank Day, I, I could easily have been a carpenter. I, would, I love working with wood. Um, I've built um, a number of things around the place my, myself, uh, including my stand-up desk at work, which was, which was built to fit the little, a little niche in, in a strangely sort of, um, what's the word, empty niche in, in my office at the Monash. Um, I wanted a particular desk that would fit there, stand-up desk. So I got hold of some, some 100-year-old recycled West Australian Jarrah which is which is l- lovely to work with, but very difficult to work with as a as a woodworker because it it blunts and breaks just about every tool that you put in there because it's so hard. Um, but uh, but otherwise makes a beautiful piece of furniture. At least I think it's beautiful. So um, so uh, so yeah, that I could easily have gone into something like carpentry or woodworking. So just to finish up, I'm wondering if you could maybe offer some advice up to either current PhD students or maybe uh, early uh, career researchers. Um, I think, I think the following is becoming ever increasingly, um, important. I mean, it's, it's always been important, but I, I think it's, it's especially with recent events around this virus that I think it's very important to keep uh, a clear eye on the big impact of, of your work. Um, in other words, people want to know whether it's your grandparents or the taxpayer who ultimately is usually paying a, a, some fraction of, of, of the cost, if not all, um, or other, other scientists in a bigger community, um, want to know what the relevance of your work is. And it's very important to, to kind of get that clear, um, but, but without overstating it. As soon as, you know, some people sort of never really sort of poke their head up, up above the trench to see what this is all really about. But then others having sort of poked their head up suddenly leap up and start you know yelling wildly about it which is equally equally uh, unuseful so to speak so what i'm referring to there is the is the overhyping of of, of work um uh, for example in this ammonia area there's there's way too many people claiming to have solved the world's ammonia problem when in fact uh, nobody has um so but, but anyway coming back to younger people um that's usually an older person's uh, ci is sort of um, um 
fault, shall we say, to want to overhype something. But I think having a keen eye then on, on what's really important and making sure that your work does key into something that is, is important, because I think ultimately that's where funding opportunities do lie. Um, or if, you, if you're doing an, a, a, a discovery project or a DECRA, for example, um, uh, application then having a key you have to be able to write a benefit section you have to be able to understand significance and innovation three incredibly important words you know that need a lot of real focus you know what what does it mean to to describe the significance as opposed to the innovation as opposed to the benefit um, of of your work and getting getting that right about your work and being able to put it in a in a in a in a, a an appropriate way and getting advice from from older people on that is is an important thing an important part of 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 your sort of research um, training and development. Some great advice there. Well, that brings us to the end of our, our podcast and our chat. Thanks so much for your time, Doug. It's been a pleasure to catch up. You are most welcome. Thanks for listening to the ACES podcast. For more episodes like this one, be sure to subscribe wherever it is you get your podcasts. You can also find more information about ACES on our website, electromaterials.edu.au. There you'll find links to our various social media platforms. And you can also follow me on Twitter, at Samuel Finlay. Until next time, thanks for listening.